we're in our series on culture, and I don't know if you've ever kind of, is this going to keep dropping out? Maybe it is. Um, we'll, we'll see how it goes, Alan. I'll try and stand very still. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried to consider what are the cornerstones of belief. Um, trying to kind of like reduce it down to what is, what is, what is it that I believe? What is really kind of important? And um, we've already touched on one of those both this morning, but also earlier in the series, and that is that God is good. Thank you, Mary. That it, if you believe that God is good, then it actually changes a lot of the way that you think about things. So then when troubles come, you approach it from a def- very different direction. Because you say, well, God is good. Therefore, he doesn't intend this to happen. Or he certainly has a way through for me. Whereas if you doubt that God is good, then all sorts of other things happen. And that's kind of really where sin started with Adam and Eve, where they doubted, well, they kind of had this doubt when the serpent said, you know, I I can give you something more than what God's given you. And they believed him. I want to start this morning... um, with what I, for me anyway, is another cornerstone. So God is good is certainly one of the cornerstones. This is another cornerstone for me, that Jesus' blood paid for everything. Everything. Jesus' blood paid for everything. There's nothing left to pay. And as a result of that, I think we can, I could finish that off and say, I owe him my complete trust. If his blood has paid for everything, then that's where the trust lies, in him. Of course, we could have included this one with when I spoke about grace a couple of weeks or three weeks ago now. The truth is that our salvation, our healing, our mental and physical health, our prosperity, our hope, our peace is all held in this one fact that Jesus' blood is sufficient. Jesus took care of everything, everything at Calvary, as we remember at Easter, that that is enough. Therefore, I can put my trust in him with absolute confidence. If I do the mic thing, then um, it it goes all phasey and weird, so... um, you might have to put this one through instead of this one to Jack. Does that make sense? It it's, was Alan's. Um, life, life consists of acts of faith. There are times when things don't seem to measure up to what we believe that God has promised for us. It's in these moments that we must trust him. It's an exercise of our faith. We look to the one who is all-sufficient. We, we trust him with absolute confidence. It's vital that we nurture this kind of trust in the middle of those times of trial. Because that's when... That's when the rubber hits the road, if you like. And it is about relationship. It's about love. It's about, in these moments, that we learn to trust, that we exercise faith. We look to the all-sufficient one. Remember Peter and Silas in prison? They chose to worship. In the dead of night... They were engaged with heaven in their damp prison cell. No doubt it was cold, uncomfortable, but they chose to worship God. 
they engaged their spirits and said, Father, you're better than this. You're bigger than this. Jesus has paid the cost. And in that place there, chains broke off, the doors opened. Sometimes it doesn't happen like that. We still put our trust in Jesus. Jesus' blood, blood paid for everything, and I owe him my complete trust. Salvation comes from God. We were talking about salvation this morning. Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, and he says, when we were dead in our sins. A dead person can't do anything to save themselves. They are beyond help. But God, and I, you know, the, the but gods in scripture are always great. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised up us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're talking about Jesus' blood and salvation. The blood to the Hebrews was synonymous with life. Jesus gave his life. And in the mystery of God's wisdom we are considered to die with Christ and then be raised to life in him as well. It's a mystery. It's one of those mysteries. How, does it, how is it that in Christ I die, when I'm already dead, I die in Christ, but then I'm raised to life again in him. So in his life, I find life. It's a mystery, but it's the truth. And the mystery of salvation it is, is that all who call on the name of Jesus are given the right to become sons of God. That's an extraordinary thing. It's to be, it, 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 we're raised to life in him, but not only that, but then we become adopted as the very children of God. So we become like Christ. Christ was always the son of God, forever, eternity. But we become like him. It doesn't matter that we're born 2,000 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus died for the ungodly. Literally, he died in the place of the ungodly. That's me. And I suspect each of us. But it's so that the ungodly become righteous. That's the exchange. And that's why we celebrate. That's why we sing Our Redeemer Lives. <laughs> because as we sing Our Redeemer Lives, we're celebrating also the fact that we live. We live in him. Jesus died at Passover. Passover was significant. For it was the time the Jews remembered the time of the escape from Egypt. The final trial that fell on the Egypt on the Egyptians was that an angel of death was released to fly over the land and take the lives of every firstborn. To protect themselves, the Jews were to sacrifice a lamb, one for each family, and put the lamb's blood on the doorposts and on the lintels of the house. And literally, the angel would pass over those houses and they would be spared. The lamb was sacrificed and it became a sin offering for the people of Israel. In later times, as they remembered, they would bring a lamb to the priests as their offering. The priest would examine the lamb for it was to be without blemish or deformity. The lamb is examined and if it's accepted, the sins of the people are considered dealt with. The people weren't examined. It was the lamb who was examined. So it is with Jesus, for it is Jesus who is examined. We, he, he was found to be without fault, perfect. 
And his sacrifice means that the sins of the world are wiped away. The curse of sin is broken. Romans 8 puts it like this. But what should we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? It's a passage that you can build your life on. God has given to us the most precious gift he already had. His own dear son. He holds nothing back. But he doesn't stop there. But graciously gives us all things. I remember John Wimber talking about how one day this guy, he had this guy come up to him and he said to him, John, I really feel that God has said to me that um, I'm ready to be trusted with, with riches. And John looked at him a bit quizzically, like, beg your pardon? <laughs> and he said, I really feel that God, you know, God has dealt with me. And he said, I'm ready now. That he, can, he can give me riches. And John said, doesn't make any sense at all. He said, he's already given you the most precious thing he's got. And that was before you even deserved anything. <laughs> the rest is just nothing. It's just like easy. It, it's not that we're somehow ready. It's that he gives. He's given his most precious thing. He doesn't withhold stuff from us because we're not ready. He gave us Jesus well before we were ready. He's just like that. He's a good God. And because of that, shouldn't I completely trust him with everything? Jesus' blood paid for everything, and I really do owe him my trust. Salvation is the greatest miracle on earth. Essentially, we had no future but now we have life, and not only that, but eternal life. I, I can be guilty, I admit, of playing down the eternal bit. And that's because for years, Christians seem to put all their hope in eternity, pie in the sky when we die, and miss out that actually we're called to bring the kingdom of God here now. That there's some, there's there's something, that eternal hope begins right now, where we are. And that hope is full of purpose and creativity and love. And I'll, I'll talk more about that when I talk about the glorious church in a, about a month. But it is that hope that fills our heart. But I want to talk about identity as well. Who am I and what is my life about? But before I go down there, I want to ask you a question. What do you think it was like to be around Jesus? What was it like? Amazing. Any other thoughts? Nobody else has any thoughts. What was it like to be with him? Sorry? Challenging. Challenging. Yeah, I think quite scary, actually, at times. Yeah, get out of the boat. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Anything else? No? I think it'd be exciting. I think, I think that joy bubbles over out of Jesus. And that to be around him was just fun. I think he was a guy full of joy. Unpredictable, maybe. Not always do the things you think might be the right thing to do. Um, and certainly the disciples had some ideas that Jesus didn't share, like calling fire down <laughs> on a village. And Jesus is like, you haven't got it, have you? 
I think there was something joyful about Jesus. We are told that the joy of the Lord is my strength. Does anyone know where that comes from? It comes from the Bible. And, and that, was good enough for Paul, that was good enough for Paul, wasn't it? Because he'd say somewhere it says, any, anyone any closer than the Bible? About Old or New Testament? Old, okay. So we, we've, somebody says Psalms. No, it's not Psalms. No, it's not Isaiah. You see... It's funny, isn't it? I, 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 I had to look this up myself. It's like, I know this verse. It's got to be in the Psalms, isn't it? Or it's got to be in Isaiah. No, it's not. Nehemiah 8. The people were grieved when they heard the law read. Do you remember Nehemiah comes back to the city, he's building the walls, and... Um, the people are all gathered, the walls are built and they're all gathered and, um, and, and he gets the priests to read the law which has been found. Um, and they all weep because they realize that they've, they've not kept any of the statutes that are in this book. And Nehemiah says, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. And, they said to, and then he said to them, go your way. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah, they all know now where it is from. But Nehemiah had battled opposition. He'd battled against intimidation. Remember, whatever his name was. Um, I can't remember anyway. The, 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 Tobiah, to, 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 anyway. Um, criticism, indifference, you know, from his own people. Sorry? Sam Ballots, yes, that was one of them. And then he had a sidekick, didn't he? Who just all the time, just needle, 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 um, you know, even if the foxes walked on what you built, it will fall down. You know, the sarcasm. Um, but Nehemiah kept going through it all. I think he'd discovered something that made his journey doable. And he, I think his discovery was that he had found that God wants his people to be joyful. Joy, being joyful makes so many things just different. <laughs> Paul also knew times of opposition and hardship, but he said this, he says, um, this is in Philippians, he says, in any and every circumstance I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and needs. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And a few verses earlier, Paul had been encouraging the people of Philippi, and he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. The easy-to-read version. I didn't even know there was such a thing, but I found this easy-to-read version. It's called the ERV. Um, puts it like this. It says, Always be filled with the joy of the Lord. I will say it again. Be filled with joy. And Paul, too, was coming from this well of joy. Times of struggle are normally, you know, a normal part of life. And we are strengthened in the struggle. But that strength is in Jesus. And I would suggest that that strength that Christ gives is rooted in joy. Facing the greatest battle of all, death on the cross we're told that Jesus endured that for the joy set before him. Joy was to Jesus something worth dying for. James, the brother of Jesus, writes, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet fit trials of various kinds. <laughs> he's either a sadist or he's hit on something kind of profound. 
His reasoning is that it will result in us lacking nothing. And we're back to all things again. He gives us all things. John writes of that our joy is being complete. Peter, of us being filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. Paul writes, describes the kingdom of God as not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If your life has no joy, then I suggest that the kingdom of God isn't touching your life nearly enough. Joy isn't the same as happiness. Bridget and I went to a concert on Friday and um, uh, the, the singer was the most doer person, to use a Scottish phrase, um, that I've ever come across. And he, he was really anti-happiness. Like, happiness is a modern invention and um, why, you know, why is everyone pursuing happiness? Because I'm certainly not. Um, yeah, anyway... Uh, bless him. May he be blessed this day. Um, but I don't think happiness and joy are the same things. And I think the pursuit of happiness isn't necessarily helpful. <laughs> joy is like an underlying propensity to gladness. The joyful person notices the joy in the world. Bridget came in. Uh, this morning and said there's a fox sitting under the tree out the f on the front lawn and he was just in the sun and that's joy in something very very small there's just a fox enjoying the sunshine and he was just really content sat on our front lawn under the tree and the sun was sort of as angled enough that it could go under the tree it's noticing those things it's noticing kind of sometimes the incongruity in, in our situation and, and it becomes mirth rather than depression. It's the kind of like, this is completely ridiculous and um, it just makes you smile. It can look at hopeless situations and say that God has an answer for that. It can be in the darkest of places and yet, it knows the light is coming. That's joy. It's something that comes out of you. And this is the challenge that I've got and I'm giving to you. Because <laughs> if your life is devoid of joy, then something needs to change. Something needs to change. You know, we can be earnest and be committed to God. And that's one thing. But if it doesn't look like joy, then there's something wrong. Religion is full of people who are earnest and committed. But so often there's no life in that. I want to mention a, a lady. She's died now, sadly. Um, well, she would be well in the hundreds by now. Uh. I can't read that. Corrie Ten Boom. She was the author of a book called The Hiding Place. And her parents lived in Nazi-occupied Holland. And they would conceal Jews in a hidden room in their house. Literally, it was like this wide, the room. It was just, they put a false wall in and there was just this narrow bit. Um, and they would hide Jews there, and then they were, they were part of an organization where they would smuggle them out of the country. They were finally caught, and she and her sister um, ended up in Ravensbrück concentration camp, a women's labor camp in Germany. And there, the two of them held secret worship services in a concentration camp. They'd somehow smuggled a Bible in. Many of those people became Christians in that darkest of places. Her sister Betsy died there. Days later, just days after Betsy died, Corrie was released. Something that actually later turned out to be a, 
a clerical error. But it was just in time as later that week it's understood that all the girls her age were sent to the gas chamber. I met Corrie when she was in her 80s, full of joy. That's what I remember. I remember a story she told about how one day she was in a cathedral walking and talking to the bishop. And he asked her about how she was able to recover from such terrible things that she'd witnessed and experienced. And Corrie, being her, and goodness knows why, but she, in her pocket, she, we used to call them power balls. They were like little rubber balls that when you bounce them, they seemed to bounce higher than ever they started. She had them in her pocket. <laughs> I don't know why. It was just her. And she was in her 80s. And she took this power ball out and she threw it to the ground. And of course it was in this cathedral. It was bouncing around in, in, this, in this cathedral, solid floors and solid walls. Um, and her point was that the harder you're thrown down, the faster you rise up. But she just did it because she loved the response of the bishop who didn't know what to do <laughs> with his ball bouncing all over the church, all over the cathedral. This, this sacred building. Um, and that sense I got from her, and he, I was quite young then, but even as, as a child, it, here was this amazing old woman who just bubbled over with joy. Her life was joy. And perhaps a little mischief. And joy is perhaps the surprising element that makes us who we are. It's the thing that rubs off on others. And it's perhaps the lack of joy that paralyzes us from moving forward. I was thinking of Jesus' parable of the men given different amounts of money by their master invest. And the one with the least was the one who was crippled by fear. Fear of failure. Fear, fear of, his, of the master. And what he did what he did was simply hide it in the ground. And the result was, in the end, that the thing he feared became true, that the money was taken from him and given to another. Joy helps us overcome fear. For joy is, as Nehemiah says, strength. And as I've been thinking about joy this week, it was, it was it's quite painful to actually realize the home truth, that over the last couple of years with COVID and, and then particularly with this terrible war in Ukraine, I had realized a lot of my joy had gone. And it's probably the way that we lose these things. It's a little bit at a time, gradually, until you don't realize that you've lost it. And I needed to repent of that before God. And secondly, I need to say sorry to you as well. Because I had. And I'm praying that, as King David prays, that he'd restore to me the joy of my salvation. As I said on, uh, in, I think, in my update. Because joy is so vital for every one of us. Salvation is a new start. We are transformed. And yet, in many ways, we're still the person we were. But the transformation continues as Paul puts it from one degree of glory to another. We become the children of God. That is, we're adopted into his family. And Phelan will, I think, be speaking about this in a, or mentioning it anyway in a few weeks' time. We're not made in any way identical some have thought that to be made into the image of Christ or to be made Christ-like is to remove our individuality. And of such thinking, I think, fails to recognize that God has made each of us in the first place. Dead in our sins we might have been, but not without some measure of godly nobility upon us. 
each of us is different, and that individually is individuality is celebrated in the Bible as we each bring something different to the body of Christ. That's how it works. As the children of God, our individually individuality can say individuality shines brighter as we come together in unity. And purpose, and I believe that each of us is designed to be personally fulfilled in all that we do. The paradox, however, is that if we pursue personal fulfillment, we'll never find it. God designed us to find joy and satisfaction in our labour by pursuing joy and sat- but sorry, but pursuing joy and satisfaction will take us in the wrong direction. And um, I think of another guy, we had Eric Corrie. Now we've got Eric, um, the Scottish Olympian and rugby player whose story is told in Chariots of Fire. He said, I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. He also said, many of us are missing something in life because we're after second best. I've expressed what I believe to be true many times, that God is profoundly interested in all you do, at home, at work, wherever. And it's looking to make him welcome in every part of your life, because he's not only interested, but he has ideas, he has creativity that can bring increase and positive change wherever you are. And that was my experience at Sony, 21 years at Sony. God spoke to me so many times. I have so many patents to my name. I can't remember any of them because they're all really boring. But they were God. They were like these moments where I'd go, ah, if we did this, then we had that. And, you know, Mr. Sony um, benefits from that. That's fine because they're all very boring. Um, and obvious as well. That's the thing about it so often. When you look back on something, it's like, that's really obvious. Why didn't anyone else think of that? Um, but every one of us is capable of discovering solutions that will transform whatever place of work you're in. And that includes those who are retired or who are looking after children at home. Wherever you are, you know, I've spoken before of a new renaissance where God's people across the world would bring positive change in every sphere of life, be that politics, industry, teaching, arts, media, medicine, farming, social care, parenting, cleaning, maintenance, you name it, everywhere. That God is interested. God, you are your God's child. And like Adam and Eve at the end of the day, he was interested in what they'd been doing in the garden. And what, you know, what are we going to do next tomorrow? And the amount of times I would drive home from work and go, Lord, I don't know what to do. I was stuck. I have no idea of how to get out of this situation. And then overnight or the next morning as I'm driving in, an idea. Oh, I'm going to try that. Didn't always work. Mostly it did. It's just extraordinary. And actually I find it as a pastor harder to hear God <laughs> don't know what to do that I did as an engineer because he's really interested in what you do where you are what you're doing can you imagine here we go, this is imagination time again second time very similar can you imagine what it would be like if Jesus said to you oh, by the way I'm coming to work with you today or I'm going to be staying at your house today. Why not invite some neighbours round? I'd love to meet them. What would it mean for that place of work and the problems you face? Or for your neighbours and the problems they face? You see, I, I believe that God's not only interested, but God not, you know, he doesn't just know you, he cares. He's interested. And this is where the kingdom of God actually happens. 
It happens in the workplace. It happens in your home. It happens when you're out at the shops. See, I, I'd have fun with those sort of... I love thinking about those sort of things, how the day would pan out. And, yeah, it would be scary at times. You know, you'd say, well, I've shown you your turn now. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> but I know it would be full of joy. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and I will, it will be done for you. For by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. You see, it's in the bearing fruit, it's in the things happening that we prove who God is, that he's good. And there's this invitation that we abide, we live in Jesus. The analogy is of vine and branches, and the two are inseparable because as the branches bear fruit, they are being the vine. So when you go to work, if you are abiding in Jesus, you take him with you. That's what you do. Jesus also said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Matthew six thirty three. The key to our fulfillment, the key to success is these two things. Firstly, relationship with Jesus, abiding in him. And secondly, seeking first the kingdom and righteousness. It's not seeking our identity. It's not seeking pleasure. It's not seeking happiness or any of those things. It's seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek to abide in Jesus I just want to end by a thought on relaxation. I am mending. You'll be pleased to know. Um, but it's important in our lives that we have times of relaxation or recreation or recreation, as some people like to kind of... Because that's what it is. It, it's like a recreation of, of who we are. Um, indeed, God decreed it that it was so. It's the Sabbath... Should be, there should be time built into your life for you to find rest. And um, I'm particularly talking to the ladies here because they find it harder than the guys to actually do that at times, especially when there's a family. It's still important. Somebody once gave the analogy of a traditional wooden bow. A bow relies upon the springiness of the wood to be effective for its power. For this reason, it's really important that when it isn't being used, the string is unhooked from the bow so that wood can return to its natural state. Of course, if it's in an unstrung state, it's of no immediate use. And you might feel that you should always be ready and be strung. But actually, ultimately, without that relaxation of the wood, the wood will resume a new shape and the power of the bow will be completely lost. It will be useless. So too, we need to unstring our bows. <laughs> it's important that you do. That's why Jesus, sorry, why, why God said, Seven days, six days shall you work, one day you will rest. And of course, yeah, there will always be those who will make a God out of relaxation, recreation, recreation. But that's not to negate the fact that God said to do it. And joy, I think, needs that time as well. It needs that time in you, just for you 
to turn off to go and enjoy the fox in the garden or the birds in the trees or whatever it is, your pottery, your painting, whatever it is that you relax doing. Our identity is rooted in salvation. It's rooted in our adoption as children of God. And the way we pursue that identity is through abiding in Jesus and through putting first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Each of us is made differently and together we bring our complementary characters and abilities together to make the body the church of God. It is glorious in its diversity and glorious in its harmony. And that's the that's the big thing, you know, as we pursue this relationship with Jesus and the kingdom of God and the righteousness of God in our lives, we are transformed in every area to bring increase and fulfillment. Let's just look at that passage. Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. And it is that increase, that fruitfulness, that's the sign of the kingdom. Anyway, Father God, I pray for myself and for everyone here, or anyone who watches this online, I pray, Father God, that we would have renewed within us the joy of your salvation. I pray, Father, that joy would bubble up within us, wherever we are, whatever we do, in work, in times of rest and recreation. Father, I pray that each of us would hear you directing us through the day and exercise faith as you give us ideas and solutions for the situations we face. I pray that you would anoint your people, Lord God, as we seek to abide in Jesus and set our hearts and minds on your kingdom, breaking into homes, into offices, into factories, shops, schools, doctor surgeries, hospitals, universities, everywhere your people are, Lord God. For your glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for your